Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and uh, welcome to our um, first collaboration uh, global classroom between the uh, Victim Justice Network and Durham College. Uh, we're thrilled to be bringing you this um, national global conversation um, today uh, with the topic tackling the justice tackling the justice gap, restorative justice in sexual violence. Um, I'd like to welcome all of our live stream audience. We have uh, lots of folks that are live streamed in and welcome to everyone. Uh, we've had over 250, uh, 275 registered for the live stream from uh, all over Canada and we're, we're thrilled about that. Just wanted to let everyone know uh, this is a pilot project for the Victim Justice Network um, with the goal to be bringing more of these global conversations uh, on varying topics. Um, and this recording and all of the material posted on the Global Classroom, uh, you'll notice that when you went to the site there were a number of resources. Those resources will be posted on the Victim Justice Network along with this, as well as the um, Durham College uh, Global Classroom site. The other thing that I wanted to let everyone know who's live streamed in is that at the end of this um, session, there will be um, a survey. We would like uh, everyone to fill out a survey. Um, if you could just take a couple of minutes and do that at the end, that would be fantastic. It would give, it would give us and it would give the Victim Justice Network um, some really great information moving forward for, next, for our next global classroom endeavors. Okay. Um, I wanted, the other thing I wanted to let you know is that um, for those of you who are live streaming, if there's a question that you want to ask, um, you can tweet that question into um, at Global Class DC, and that will appear on my screen that I'm, that I'm sitting in front of. Uh, and what I'll do is when the conversation, as this is, this is a conversation that we want to have today, um, but as the conversation is going, if you have any questions that you'd like to tweet in, please feel free to do that. It'll show up on my screen, and if we have time or if I can group them into um, themes and present those questions back, then we're, we're welcome to do that, okay? Um, That's all I have about that. <laughs> so I'd like to start um, by actually introducing our classroom group. Um, so I'm going to start kind of with the groups, and then I'm going to introduce our guest speaker today. And so we are uh, the Durham College and Victim Justice Network group. Um, Priscilla de Villiers and Peter Sampio are with me, um, as well as a number of the graduate students in the victimology program at Durham College. So we are absolutely thrilled. This is the first time we've done this, so we're really excited to be here. Um, we also have um, Sonia and the Kawartha Sexual Assault Center in mm. Peterborough. Um, hi, Sonia. Hi. <laughs> um, do you want to just take um, about a minute and introduce your group? Sure, thank you. Uh, Nothing like putting you on the spot. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. We have a group of about uh, 10 people here. We have uh, uh, some staff from uh, the Sexual Assault Center here in Peterborough. Uh, we have um, uh, some representatives from the Peterborough Police Services here, a uh, representative from Victim Services uh, here, um, a representative from uh, the John Howard Society who is involved in a restorative justice program with the John Howard Society, uh, some students and myself, and uh, so we're thrilled to be part of this group. Thank you. Uh, all right, well, welcome, welcome. Um, and in our other um, location, we have Carolyn Sinclair. Um, Carolyn is the Executive Director of Victim Services for British Columbia. And could you spend a minute and introduce your group, Carolyn? Yes, thank you. So we're, we are West Coast partners of the Victim Justice Network and we represent Police Victim Services. So we have Roselle from Port Moody Police, which is a municipal police uh, department here. We have her practicum student, Jay. We also have Heather Hildred, who is the Director of Victim Services for RCPE <coughs> Division. And Sergeant Sherry Gulliver, who is in charge of the Victim Services and Crime Prevention Program for New Westminster Police. And myself. Oh. That's fantastic. Thank you for joining us. 
So the way that we're going to um, work this today is I'm going to introduce our guest speaker, who is Dr. Joanne Wemmers from the University of Montreal. And Joanne is going to um, do a presentation about her research in the area of restorative justice and sexual violence. And then we would really like to open this up to a discussion. Um, so once Dr. Wemmers has completed her presentation, um, I, what I'd like to do is just um, put it to the floor and um, just start a conversation um, and from varying areas. Okay? That makes sense? That's good for everybody? Excellent. And then if we get... Is that good? Okay. And then once we... Uh, I'll, I'll keep my eye on the, on the Twitter feed and the questions that come in and, and um, if I can kind of fit them into the context of the conversation, then I will definitely do that. Okay? So, I would like to introduce our um, guest speaker. Uh, Dr. Joanne Wemmers is a full professor at the School of Criminology of the University de Montreal, as well as the principal researcher at the International Centre for Comparative Criminology. She has published widely in the area of victimology, international criminal law and restorative justice. Her books include Reparation for Victims of Crime Against Humanity, The Healing Role of Reparation, Therapeutic Jurisprudence and Victim Participation in Justice, International Perspectives, Introduction um, a la Vic... Oh. Sorry, I'm, I knew I was going to do this. I knew this wasn't going to go well. <laughs> um, introduction a la victimologie, caring for victims of crime and victims in the criminal justice system. In, uh, in 2015, Dr. Wemmers was awarded a certificate of appreciation by the World Society of Victimology for her contribution to victimology and the society. Former editor-in-chief of the French journal Criminologie, she is currently editor of the International Review of Victimology and the journal Internationale de Victimologie. Dr. Wemmer's new book, Victimology, A Canadian Perspective, will be published by the University of Toronto Press in 2017. So welcome, Dr. Wemmer's. Thank um, you. So you, is there some, would you like to um, say anything else before you start your presentation? No, I think we should get to it. Okay, Thank you. let's I do mean, it then. As I say, You're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is the first time I've ever done this as well, so uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll have a good, or at least I hope we'll have a great discussion that comes from this. Uh, today I'll be talking about tackling the justice gap, restorative justice and sexual violence. The, the justice gap refers to the fact that when it comes to particular types of victimization, such as sexual violence, um, a, very few victims report their victimization to authorities, and, and even if a victim does report to authorities, then um, very few cases result in a conviction. And so this in the literature is referred to as the justice gap, uh, and that victims are left wanting for justice. Can we go to the next sli slide, please? So this justice gap, it, 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 it's, been known for, it's been known for a long time, and it became very, very apparent in the 1970s with the emergence of victim sur victimization surveys that showed, uh, you know, hard facts data uh, regarding the low reporting rates um, for certain types of victimization, such as sexual violence. And this led in the 80s to legal reform. Uh, here in Canada, for example, we completely overhauled the criminal code regarding uh, sexual violence. And, and this was done in an, in an effort to reduce what's called secondary victimization. So victims feeling victimized a, a second time as their case goes to the criminal justice system um, in order to improve reporting. The idea was if, that we can prove, make it a better experience for victims, the criminal justice system, maybe they'll be more willing to report their victimization to authorities. Because effectively, if victims don't report a crime to authorities, well then authorities, police, the, the justice system cannot respond to it. And this means essentially that we're, we're not reacting, we're not, we're condoning sexual violence. And is this something that we want to see? And no. And so the idea was we have to change things. We have to try to make it better. And so the um, criminal law, the criminal code here in Canada was um, uh, changed in the 80s to uh, uh, change its definition of sexual violence. Can we go to the next slide? Because I don't see it anymore. Voila, the next one, please. 
Yeah. There we go. They changed the definition completely of sexual violence, introducing, getting rid of the old notion of, of, of rape um, uh, and moving to it is to what they call sexual violence, it is now called. And the idea, this was something that was very much motivated by feminists at the time, the idea was to emphasize the violent nature of this type of crime. Um, and um, so, so the total overhaul, totally new concept of sexual violence. Um, shifting the focus to the violent nature uh, away from uh, uh, the, uh, the rape as the former concept. So next slide, please. Along with this, the definition, we do the next, there we go. Another thing that, that was done in, is rape shield, it's called. And the idea was that there would be limitations in, in produced in terms of what victims could be asked um, when they present evidence, when they testify in the criminal trial process. So, for example, a criminal defense lawyer could no longer ask and can no longer ask victims about their um, sexual behavior in the past, for example. So these, these safeguards, these limitations were put in in order to make it a less, less painful experience for victims, the interrogation and, and, and the cross-interrogation, cross-examination. Um, during the criminal justice process. Um, did we just miss a slide? Or is it my imagination? Anyway, the next, the other other thing that was introduced as well, ah, oh, that was it. Okay, so another okay. thing that was introduced as well was the um, uh, victim impact statement. The, the idea that um, while victims, particularly in sexual assault cases, the victims will often have to testify. Often there aren't other witnesses um, uh, so there'll be a main source of information about the crime, but that doesn't allow them to speak them, their mind. They can only answer questions. And so the victim impact statement was introduced for all victims of crime, but also including uh, victims of sexual violence, in order to allow them to have an opportunity after <coughs> conviction, um, at the, the sentencing hearing, to express the impact that the crime had on them, to be able to speak more freely about how they were inf affected by their uh, crime. So all of these changes, and now we can go to the next slide, despite all of these changes, um, victims continue uh, to have very low reporting rates for sexual violence, and among those who do go to the police, very, very few result in a conviction. Next slide, please. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Oh, that one, we can go to the next one. This one was in the wrong order, sorry. Can we go to the it's next no one, problem. please? It's, it's no good. Problem. It it's might be good. a little bit delayed at your end. Delayed your end. Delayed your end. You're okay? Yeah, good. Good. Perfect. This is where we want to be. So I said victims rarely report. These are some um, uh, findings that we have in Canada and elsewhere. And I think that's important to emphasize, too, is that even while I'm, I'm talking today largely about the situation in Canada, it's not unique to Canada. This is something that we'll see in the UK, we'll see it in Australia, we'll see it in the United States. Any you know, industrialized countries where we have access to the type of data that we can actually assess it show similar patterns. Um, and so in Canada, while one out of three victims will report their victimization to police, only one in ten victims will do this for sexual assault. So you see 90% of victims will not even go to the police. Um, which means the, the vast majority of crimes, uh, sexual assaults, remain outside of the, the grasp of criminal justice. Next slide, please. There's also the question of attrition. Um, when victims do report their crime, uh, the victimization, it's unlikely to end in a conviction. Um, again, not unique to Canada. Uh, Compared to other crimes, sexual assault of, uh, offenses are less likely to be cleared than other offenses and less likely to result in a conviction um, for all sorts of reasons. Can we go to the next slide, please? And we'll look at some of those reasons. One, for example, at the police stage already, after reporting, a victim may change her mind. She may say, you know, um, I, I don't want to go through with this. Once she learns a little bit more about the criminal justice process or after speaking with police, the victim may decide not to go ahead. And, and while I should point out that, that in our criminal justice system, um, once victims report their crime to the police, essentially their victimization becomes most property of the state. It's up to the state to decide whether or not to go ahead with it. In most cases, a prosecutor or will tell you that it, if a victim does not want to go forward in these types of cases, it's not worth pushing them, um, simply because a non-collaborative victim uh, witness is, 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 is not going to help the case. And so they will often, they'll generally respect the wishes of the victim. 
Um, another reason is that victims or police may find insufficient evidence to refer the matter to the prosecuting agency. Now, often for these types of offenses, there may not be any other witnesses than the victim themselves, the victim and the accused. So it becomes very, very difficult or it's very limited information available in terms of proof. Another factor that we have to bear in mind is when we talk about sexual offenses, often when, if the victim does go to and report it, it may be years after the offense. We saw this recently with the Gomenji case. More often than not, it could be several years after the victimization that, that she actually refer, reports to police, which means that there will be physical evidence may not be available anymore at that point in time, which again makes it difficult to build a case. Um, if the victim has continued and the case does go to the prosecutor, there's, they feel there's enough evidence to go forward, at the court stage it may stop, either at that point that the victim decides, I want to withdraw my complaint, I don't want to go further, or that the prosecutor decides, well, at the end of the day, the information, the evidence that we have is inadmissible or it's unreliable, and, and so decides not to go further. Or that it's a forensic decision, that there is no reasonable prospect of securing a conviction, for example, if the credibility of the witness, the victim, has been brought into question, um, this may they may think that well, it's not worth pursuing, and um, come to the decision to to stop. Um, so you, we see there's a lot of different reasons affecting uh, the high attrition rates, explaining the high attrition rates for these particular types of victimizations, which explain the justice gap. And can we go to the next slide, please? This has led researchers and those working with victims of sexual violence to say there must be another way. Clearly, this isn't the most effective, the most the, 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 a perfect solution, the criminal justice process. Should we, can we find other ways that are able, better able to meet victims' needs, uh, offer alternatives to victims? And hence, the, the, there's been some research, some discussion on restorative justice as a possible alternative to curb, uh, the current criminal justice process. So to begin with, um, I'd like to first say, what, what is restorative justice? Just so that we have a common understanding, and perhaps we can go to the next slide. Because um, there are a lot of different definitions that you can find in the literature, and, and, and we're not talking about, we're not doing that today, so we'll just quickly go to one definition, which is, is quite popular, uh, one that has been used by the United Nations, among others, um, focusing on restorative justice as a process in which all parties with a stake in the offense, so that will be the victim, that will be the accused, that may be other people, other family members, other people from the community, um, but importantly, the victim, will come together to collectively identify the harms. So what are, what are the harms resulting from this victimization? What are the needs of victims? And what are the, ob the obligations in order to heal and put things as right as possible? So you bring the parties together and, and it's a discussion about the offense and what can be done to repair or to heal uh, the harm that has been uh, committed. And there are lots of different ways of doing this. One popular way that you can read about is, is victim offender dialogue, what some people refer to as mediation. Uh, there are youth conferences, uh, lots of different ways of doing it. Um, what's important to remember too is that restorative justice by definition a voluntary process and that's a distinction from the criminal justice system that's why I pointed out before that once a victim reports to the crime to the to the police it then becomes the property of the state this is completely voluntary no one will force a victim to or an offender for that matter it has to be something that the uh, parties agree to participate in next slide please to give an example of how this could work something we've seen here in recently, um, we can look at the Dalhousie University Facebook incident, which was all over the media last December. Um, that was a, a private Facebook group created by a group of male dentistry students at Dalhousie University in uh, Nova Scotia. And what had happened was the, some of the male classmates had been uh, posting inappropriate comments on the Facebook page, uh, such as, which classmates would you have hate sex with? And this led, when to, to, to outroar, uh, outrage at the university and, and larger within, the, within Canada, one could even say. Um, the first reaction by the university, uh, and I should point out that Dalhousie has um, Jennifer Llewellyn, who is a, a strong researcher in the area of restorative justice. Uh, they contacted her and they asked her to speak with the, 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 the people involved, the parties involved, to see if restorative
justice would be an alternative, would, would, would work. And um, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah. And the women, um, after consultation, the women agreed to participate. Um, and But this led to very strong negative reactions by other faculty members uh, who wrote letters of protest saying that the university was shirking its responsibility and that these male students should be uh, expelled and, uh, and the, the rumors that women were to participate in this uh, restorative justice process and basically condemning the decision to use restorative justice. I think this is very important because um, the, the, what came out afterwards, and, and, and there have been a number of publications on this afterwards, including articles by the women involved, is that this was something that they had been consulted about and something that they themselves chose to do. And they could explain very clearly why they wanted to do this. This was their choice, not something they were forced to do. Um, next slide, please. And I think this resistance that we saw around the Dalhousie incident um, is, is, uh, reflects a, greater, a, a larger trend uh, among victimologists, among feminists. Um, uh, there is some concern, and it's, it's something we'll see quite often, it's been expressed repeatedly, for victim safety and secondary victimization when it comes to gender-based violence and restorative justice. Now, this is a very real concern, and I think that it's something that should be taken seriously. Uh, but my point is, it shouldn't stop us from exploring restorative justice as an alternative for victims when, un, when the conditions are satisfactory and when victims want to participate in that. Uh, the concern is the power imbalance. The idea that in these types of victimizations, victims often know the offender. Maybe the violence is continuing. Maybe she feels um, she's being manipulated or coerced into participating. And this is if, something that should be avoided at all costs. We don't want uh, secondary victimization to occur. The result of this resistance has been a lot of public and professional opposition to the idea of restorative justice in cases of uh, gender-based violence. And in some places, it's simply ruled out completely. This is something that uh, in the States has been going on, in Arizona, for example, and in Quebec, too, it's an issue where gender violence and restorative justice is very controversial. Can we see the next slide, please? What's important for me and why I think that we have to have this conversation is that some victims are interested in restorative justice, and I think that has to be respected. If we go back to, to what I said at the beginning, that one in ten victims of sexual violence report their victimization to police, one in four, when asked about it in one of the Canadian uh, victimization surveys a few years back, one in four expressed an interest in restorative justice. And there I should say restorative justice was defined as a victim-offender dialogue or mediation. And uh, so that is interesting because you see there's a much higher percentage of victims interested in restorative justice than they are reporting to the police. So that, that should tell us something right there. Um, perhaps the next slide. So it has benefits for victims. And I think that that's one of the things that's it's come out of the research and needs to be um, uh, emphasized is that the victims who choose to participate in restorative justice um, find that there's a reduction in symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, stress is reduced, fear is reduced, anxiety, um, and for many victims they'll talk about empowerment, that they feel like they're re taking control back uh, over their lives. Whereas victimization can often be a loss of control, this is a moment in which they can regain control. So it is very important from a therapeutic point of view for the, the, the women who have participated in these uh, programs. There are some interesting programs as well that have integrated uh, forms of restorative justice in victim therapy. And that's quite interesting too, because then you get to see how restorative justice can become a, a tool uh, in the healing process for victims. So for these reasons, I think it's important that we, we look at the possibility of restorative justice in cases of sexual violence and not um, simply discard it because they're of, uh, a, possible, uh, a possibility of secondary victimization. Can we look at the next slide, please? Uh, one of the, um, the, the questions that keeps coming up then is, is well, sh when should we tell victims about it? Should we tell victims about it? Or should we just wait? A victim who wants to participate in restorative justice will tell us that. And so we've, we've done research on that. Um, and we talk about the protective, rather proactive approach to restorative justice. And victims are quite clear as they would pr prefer a proactive approach. They want to know so that they, when they report the crime, 
police, for example, that they receive information about the criminal justice process, but they're also informed about alternatives. And not because they have to choose right away, but because they can use that information and think about what it is they want to do. That knowledge is empowered, and it may be now, it may be never, it may be in two years, but at one point they might be interested in participating in restorative justice. But with that information, they can make that choice, and that's the important thing. So a proactive approach is um, um, an informing victims of this possibility uh, as soon as possible. Can we move to the next slide, please? Another aspect that's very important is the question of accountability. And this is really what's very different with the criminal justice system, where the criminal justice system, the, um, the offender will plead non guilty, right? Will be advised by his lawyer to plead not guilty in more cases than not. And, and then it's up to the state to prove that, that the person is guilty of a crime. And with restorative justice, because it's a voluntary process and the people, victims and uh, offenders, have to agree to participate, going into it already, there is a recognition by the offender of harm caused. And that is a world of difference for victims. Rather than denying it, that it's never ever taken place, there's a recognition from the beginning, which opens the door to dialogue and which opens the door to, um, to, to, to the healing process for victims. So this is an important difference. Um, with the criminal justice process. Next slide, please. Another issue that's important is prevention. Um, often when victims will report a crime to the police, prevention is one of the, the reasons why they mentioned by victims, why they did so, either to stop it from happening to them or to stop it from happening to other people, other women. Um, and this is something that we saw in the Dalhousie Facebook incident as well. Uh, one of the reasons why women who participated chose to participate in restorative justice at that in that particular example was because they were um, concerned. These were dentistry students, and and they said, "We are the peers of these young men, and when they go into the workforce upon completing their degree, they'll be working in dental offices, and your class dental office will have a dentist who's often going to be a male." surrounded by female support staff, the, the receptionist, the hygienist, etc. And those women working with them may not be their peers, but be their employees, and may not feel that they can stand up to them. Um, and they felt that because they clearly were their peers, it was important to them to make sure that these young men knew what they had done wrong, why they felt that way, so that they could prevent it from happening to other women in the future who might not have that privilege, that ability to speak up and uh, to, to these guys if, if they took that behavior into the, into the workforce with them. Um, so that was an important reason. I think that's interesting too, is the idea that this can uh, help women, again, empower them, taking back control and help other women as well in the future. Perhaps we could go to another slide. There we go, the community. Another thing, it's, we talked about different parties who participate in the restorative justice process, the victim, the accused, and also the community. And that's one of the things that's interesting in it because sexual violence often doesn't just affect the, the victim himself or herself, but the family, the friends, or can also be impacted. And in some cases, it may be interesting, or at least restorative justice allows that, the opportunity for them to participate as well in this process. It can also expose underlying issues that are in the community. For example, again, going back to the Dalhousie Facebook incident, the uh, restorative justice process allowed the discussion, allowed them to bring to the forefront these, these, this, this culture of misogyny, of sexism, of discrimination that had been alive within the university and had contributed to the existence of the Facebook group, allowed these guys to think, well, this is acceptable behavior. So it allowed them also to bring to discussion more general attitudes within the university, uh, not just this one incident, and that contributed to the victimization. Next slide, please. So one of the questions is, well, what's its relationship with cr uh, the criminal justice system? Um, up till now, I've been talking about it as an alternative to the criminal trial process, and that's one of the ways that you see it used in the in the programs that, the, that they've done with victims of sexual violence. However, it's important to point out that it doesn't always have to be that way. That remember, it's flexible restorative justice. It can be complementary to the criminal trial process as well. It may be that, for example, after conviction, 
um, the victim has the possibility or the desire to uh, participate in uh, a victim-offender dialogue with the offender. So the one doesn't rule out the other. Um, and I think that's important to bear in mind that depending on the context, the victim, their particular needs, um, different shapes and forms and in different uh, relationship to the criminal justice process. Okay, so next slide, please. So I think that it's important to talk about the criteria because, um, again, we don't want to uh, create secondary victimization. We, it's important to take uh, into consideration the gender imbalance, the imbalance of power in this gender-based violence, uh, I mean. So you see from the research is that it's important in order to, to reduce the risk of secondary victimization that it be victim-centered. That is, that the prioritize victims and their needs. Um, that it be victim initiated. So that doesn't mean the victim shouldn't have the information. The victim should have the information about restorative justice. However, the uh, initiating restorative justice itself, the actual process, should be um, come from the victim uh, in order to ensure that it's something that's meeting the victim's needs and not necessarily someone else's needs. Um, preferably, and this is, this is one of the things that I, I think is important to highlight, and I'm glad that we have a some support folk here today, integrated in victim support. I know that, that victim participation in the criminal justice system is well integrated in victim support, but when it comes to restorative justice, it's not always. And, and at least that's the case in Quebec here, and it would be interesting to hear how it is elsewhere in Canada. And I think that particularly from a therapeutic point of view, it would be very important and helpful for victims to have it integrated in uh, victim support services. Also, it's important that these uh, while it may be informal restorative justice, it's important that it be carried out by highly qualified personnel, people who are specialized in sexual violence. Again, people who you need to have someone who's um, aware of the nuances of gender-based violence, is able to um, work uh, in a you know in a professional manner with victims of, of this particular type of uh, of crime. So I know it's not something that you, you, know, you anyone can do. It's something I think that it has to be well organized in order to ensure that the risk of secondary victimization is minimum and that the uh, probability of assisting or help victims is, is, is maximum. So to conclude, and that will be the last slide, um, to conclude, legal reform has not closed the justice gap for victims of sexual violence. Uh, and I think it's a time to listen to and to develop innovative responses which meet their needs and promote healing while respecting the rights of the accused, hence to explore restorative justice in cases of sexual violence. So that's my presentation. Now the dynamic part. <laughs> Well, thank you very, very much, Dr. Wimmers. That is, that was fantastic. That's a, we uh, we realized that we gave you a very small window in which to um, present a lot of information. So you can breathe now. <laughs> um, so I just want to um, move ahead now. I, I just want to reflect on on one of the. Um, the slides and the information about Dalhousie and how you mentioned how important it was in the um, in the Dalhousie case to to have a conversation. It started a conversation um, about the um, about the um, what was going on, kind of campus wide, school wide, and this was an opportunity in this case to actually open up that conversation. So I want to kind of take that as a segue to open up a conversation here. Um, and I, the other thing that I would like to address is the question that you asked, um, and I'm going to ask this now, um, both to the um, group in Peterborough as well as the um, the group group in Vancouver is because um, this is an opportunity to have that conversation. So what is the integration of restorative justice practices in your area? Um, it was a question that Dr. Wimmers kind of put on the table and I'd like to uh, open that up to the other groups as well. So who wants to start? <laughs> um, so uh, Sonia with the... No? Is your mic on? You're on? Oh, okay. on? Yep. Uh, Sonia with the uh, accent. Sonia with the Court of Sexual Assault Center, and uh, um, oh, I'm going to say that uh, in this area, and and when I think about this area, I'm thinking about uh, 
a four county area so it's a geographically a size uh, maybe like Prince Edward Island it's about that that size uh, we do not have a, a formal integrated restorative um, approach to um, sexual violence the criminal justice system and restorative practices but I would say that there is informal um, restorative approaches uh, that happen in pockets in in the uh, in the four county area um, I would be very curious to hear uh, if there is a formal uh, program in Canada um, uh, I know of, of some formal programs in uh, the states but in Canada do do our victim services you know on the west coast or or in in Quebec do, is there a form, formal program um, so not informal that people approach it from a restorative practice but is there a formal program and who did Dalhousie reach out to in terms of uh, so it's two questions. Who did? Uh, so do we have a formal program? And when Dalhousie reached out, uh, Joanne, you had commented on uh, someone being uh, uh, very aware of the nuances in sexual violence. So who did they contract with? Was it a, a restorative practitioner or a, a practitioner who understood sexual violence? Uh, for the Dalhousie, it was done with uh, Jennifer Llewellyn, who is a, a law professor and has been working in the area of uh, restorative justice for uh, a very long time. And um, they, in Nova Scotia in general, they have uh, been working in restorative justice for a long time as well. So there's quite an, an elaborate network uh, of which she is a member as well. Uh, with the local community uh, groups, et cetera, uh, in the area. I'm not sure which particular uh, group expert on sexual violence they were liaising with, um, but I can say that she, she's been working in this area for quite a while um, to that point. In terms of uh, uh, services, victim support services in Quebec that deal with restorative justice in a more systematic way, I only know of one, and that is... Um, uh, one that deals with it after uh, there has been, for example, a conviction uh, where the it's part of a in the therapeutic approach to victims. If the therapist thinks that the victim, uh, it would be helpful to them to participate in, uh, in dialogue with the offender, then they will suggest it to the victim. And it's quite interesting because it's one of the places that we um, studied uh, with Tina Kifon Kump with my, my PhD student and I. And the victims who participated in it were, were actually often, their reaction was, was one of pride when their therapist suggested to them that this is something that they felt they were ready to do. Um, again, often cases of sexual assault, they know they're an offender. Um, and so they know, and they have an idea of who it is they'll be meeting, right? Um, and the thing is that they felt that uh, they had the confidence now to go that next step and tell the and engage in a in a in a conference in a dialogue with their offender. So as part of the healing process, but that's only one um, uh, service that does that. For the rest, they they tend not to um, do that sort of participate in any very few in violent cases to begin with. Often it'll be for more um, uh, petty uh, um, uh, what are the word property crimes. Uh, Joanne, this is. Sorry, oh, just before just before you leave. Oh, sorry. I didn't. I don't want to. I just wanted to say that there is a, a organization in Ontario called Community Justice Initiatives in Kitchener Waterloo, and they're mm -hmm. one of the oldest restorative justice organizations in Canada. I think they're about forty five years old now, and they have a program called Revive and um, might be Stride. I forget what it's called, but they have facilitated dialogues. Um, they have groups for survivors of sexual harm, and they have groups for people who've committed sexual harm. And these are for people who are both court ordered and people who have voluntarily participated. And they facilitate uh, uh, family and uh, large group discussions. So in church communities, for example, where something has happened and people aren't willing to press charges, but they want there to be some kind of healing in the in the community. So they've done 
work around that, and I, I have a lot of respect for their work. So I'd be curious if you're familiar or can speak a little bit more to what they do. Um, and then there's a college in the States that I came across called Swarthmore. That's um, Swarthmore, uh, S-W-A-R-T-H-M-O-R-E, I think it's called. It's quite a small college, but my sense is that they may be leading or have some emerging research around the impacts of um, restorative justice with uh, sexual assault. And this it comes in response to the United States recently uh, implementing, what do they call it, Section 99, or I forget what it's called, but where all the universities are required now to have some kind of um, response system. And they, you know, they, they just, if they were to expel and suspend every case, they would, I mean, they just wouldn't be able to, uh, continue operations probably. So they, they're, they're trying to find other, other ways to, uh, to navigate that. And it looks like restorative approaches are on the rise within universities in the, in the States. And I know in Ontario, we're just beginning that process. So I'm just curious to see how that pans out here as it takes shape. I know that they're supposed to have policies, but I think that's still a little slow. So anyway, that's just, I thought I wanted to add that. Okay, thanks. I don't know that particular program. One of the ones I did look at in particular was in Arizona, the Restore Project. But what was interesting there was that they, um, um, in part because of the universities, Ministry of Education, et cetera, they had to put an end to the program because, uh, again, for this, this concern about secondary victimization, they were not open that at that level. The universities, the, the governmental level, was not open to restorative justice, and so they refused to continue to fund the project, so it was shut down, unfortunately. Um, but I'm, I'm glad to hear that there are pockets here and there of these initiatives. Mm -hmm. I, and Carolyn, I know, just from a, oh, sorry, sorry, just from a, sorry, I just, just commenting about the post-secondary. I know that um, in terms of post-secondary um, policies and procedures, um, in, in terms of our institution, we, we have um, specific policies and procedures around um, wellness. It's a wellness process. It's it. I, I mean, it's probably a semantic um, piece that that has a restorative justice um, part to it because we look at um, institutionally, we look at the um, issue around wellness for for all parties involved, um, and that's a that's a policy. I know the um, Canadian Association for Threat Assessment Professionals has. Um, a, a group, a subgroup that actually talks specifically about um, risk within post-secondary institutions and that you have to work with all parties. Um, so just, uh, and those would be individual policies for, for each institution. Yeah. I oh, know it's good and I think it's important to remember the Dalhousie case, that wasn't a, you couldn't, it wasn't a, a you couldn't report it to, I mean, you could report it to the police, but it wasn't a criminal yeah. offense would have happened. Okay. That's the yes, whole idea. Yeah. So I think that in, in the context, this was very, very interesting the way they chose to yeah. deal with it. Yeah, yeah. Carolyn, did you, um, <coughs> what about How in your area? Thank you. So I was just going to speak to the program. We do have a community justice uh, group who will conduct what we can, we call them VOMPs, vic Victim Offender Mediation Programs. Uh, they're not necessarily designated to sexual violence, but that would be depending on the case that was brought to them. But the big picture around restorative justice, I think, and my colleagues will, will chime in, I'm sure, as we go through, but I think currently we're looking at it as not so much an integrated approach, but more from, and I'm speaking from a victim services perspective, um, that it would be more of a referral to a trusted <laughs> professional, a trusted agency. And I think maybe um, we look at restorative justice in many different ways and um, certainly appreciate that it, it, it offers appropriate remedies. But within our policing and victim service community, I think we see it more of a, a referral or an, a trusted uh, Passover to an agency as opposed to an integrated approach. Um, but I'll refer to my colleagues who are behind me here. <laughs> Anybody want to speak to that? If I may, uh, um, uh, where we would 
think about the integrated approach, uh, I'm just going to tag on to something Joanne said earlier, is the idea of the therapeutic process being a, a seamless process that might include elements of a restorative practice versus finish therapy, uh, close the file, <coughs> refer to a restorative approach. We would I think from a you know from a, our center's perspective would want it to look like a an integrated approach that that they're not and I, I like the idea of the the complementary approach uh, as well in terms of a, a process maybe even parallel to the justice system so those are the two that that I would lean uh, uh, to exploring that integrated idea um, embedded within that therapeutic process, uh, given that restorative practices are also therapeutic in and of themselves. Hi there, it's Heather Hildred here. Hi there, it's Heather Hildred here from British Columbia. I work as the Victim Service Program Director with the RCMP. And as Carolyn said, in British Columbia, we have a few different models of victim services, but within the police force, the police-based victim service programs that we have provide crisis intervention, support through court, police file updates, and so forth. But um, we do not provide therapy or counseling the victim service workers are not licensed to do that. So I wanted to make that clear because the previous speaker was talking about the idea of um, integrated approaches rather than finishing off therapy. And I wanna make it very clear that victim service workers for the most part are not certified counselors. We do not provide therapy. Um, the one thing that we do in terms of referral is provide referral to the clients that we're working with at any time within their process or their path through the justice system or not. They may choose not to go through the justice system. And one of the referrals that we think about is restorative justice, if it's appropriate. <coughs> so our victim service programs that are police-based um, that work within police detachments will talk to victims about referral to counseling, referral to therapy, referral to grief support, referral to a sex assault center, referral to restorative justice. And it can be done concurrently. It can be done at any time before, after, what have you. But we definitely explain it to victims, but it's their choice whether or not they want to pursue any type of referral. And so it may be an integrated approach. It may run concurrent. It may not. But that's that's what we look at and how we work in British Columbia. And um, it's not the victim service programs that take on restorative justice. We have separate contracts from provincial government for victim service programs and for restorative justice programs. So in British Columbia, they do run separately. So it's not the victim service programs that offer RJ, it's the RJ programs that offer RJ and our police and our police-based victim service programs can and do refer clients to that type of system, that type of program um, at a variety of points through uh, the process and of course some of those referrals from police are alternate measures if um, an individual is going through the court system. I have to say though that I haven't seen very many um, programs, restorative justice programs per se, that are focused on sexual assault. I think that um, I suppose that seems like a touchy subject um, and people are worried about referring um, individuals of domestic violence to RJ or individuals who have been sexually assaulted to RJ. But I have heard some really good success stories as well. Um, and I would, I'd love to hear more from restorative justice programs that are um, live streaming to hear if people have had success stories. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. This is where I would see it, right? Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. I think that's an important distinction that you make regarding the police-based victim services. That you're not, you're not. It's not a therapeutic uh, context. The, the work relationship that you're having. That's more information-based. So yes, that that's a that's a fair point. It would be in, in that case more interesting to to sort of see if you could get it integrated in sexual assault services, for example. Eh? For example, what you have there at your in Kawartha, um, two very different approaches. Um, so I, you do have to bear the context 
in mind in terms of uh, you know the victim support context, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Are there any questions for the people out there? I think that's an excellent question raised. Uh, people out there who are in restorative justice and maybe want to talk about their programs that they offer. And if you um, if you do, if you have any questions, please just um, tweet them in at Global Class DC, and I can um, I can present them to the group. Or suggestions. I have yeah. a. Oh, I, can I just say what um, that. The success stories um, in in Vancouver. Would you be able to come back uh, in Vancouver to the to the chair? Um, something as I was watching, you know, uh, Dr. Wemmer's really detailed presentation and thinking. You know, where is this working? And you mentioned success stories. There been. Would you be able to tell us what? Uh, I'm sorry, your name in Vancouver again? It's. My name's Heather Hildred, and I work for the Heather. RCMP E Division. And I've okay. I've heard I've heard really through the grapevine that um, okay. there have been some success stories because a lot of the um, programs out there are not contracted to provide restorative justice to domestic violence victims or sex assault victims. Some of them have um, taken those individuals on because they have identified that they want to go through that method. So I have heard that. Um, it's been very successful for some people that have chosen to um, talk about domestic violence in a restorative circle or sex assault in a restorative circle. But that's what I was saying as well, is it would be interesting to hear from people that are um, live streaming or that are tweeting in right, that actually yeah. um, oversee RJ programs to hear where it is working and how it is working, because I've definitely heard some success stories in that front. Now, one that I can mention that's an interesting offshoot, I suppose, of sexual assault is sexting. We have within the RCMP and E division dealt with <laughs> sexting files yeah, where right. um, some of the people that are involved are minors. And I've seen one case go through the court system. It wasn't very successful, unfortunately, because of cognitive in nature. And I saw the other sexting file go through a restorative justice method where the police-based victim service program and the police referred the individuals in the sexting file, both the victims and the offenders, to a restorative justice process. And it was very successful because the individuals were all minors, their parents were involved as well, and the, um, the accused, shall we say, they didn't really understand the impact that the sexting had on the victims, and they were all able to speak to each other. Um, and it was a really, really successful outcome. And uh, I, thought, I thought that was very interesting. It also gave people the opportunity to look at crime in an online environment and the discussion sure. around, you know what, it's online, but that doesn't make it any different than something that would happen face to face or what have you. And the, the criminal code would look at it in the same way so it was a very interesting process and, and it does um, relate back to sexual assault. The programs that were involved there were the police-based victim service program that made a referral to, we have a community-based victim service program in BC as well that works with sex assault victims, sexting victims, and then RJ program was also involved. So that's a very, hmm. it was a very interesting success story. And Heather, just to ask the victim, what did the victim say in the end about this successful process that would be the most important person here what did the victim say there were multiple victims in the sexting file and i think that they all came back and said that they felt um much more comfortable knowing that they had been able to speak to the individuals the boys in this case that had been doing the sexting and keeping their pictures and threatening they felt um like the boys had actually realized the impact that they had had on the girls and that they hadn't really done it um, knowing the gravity of the situation and the gravity of the impact on the girls. And the parents' um, reaction was very interesting as well. I think some of the parents, and I can't speak for them, but some of the parents were very upset and angry and when they were able to come together they also realized that this was a human a human mistake a human system it was very educational whereas the sexting file that went through the justice system did not have that outcome at all it was no, um far more punitive and people were not able to apologize and make yeah. amends so it was, it was very interesting yeah thank you heather
that. Thank you. And just, just kind of reflecting back on what Dr. Wemmers was saying about the Dalhousie case too, and the um, the victims in that case really wanting um, the you know offenders in the case to to recognize the appropriateness um, of what they were doing, and and it's it's kind of it kind of parallels on that a little bit um, in terms of. You know, once you're out in the community and once you've graduated from school and you have, you know, um, admin support working for you and that that there is a, a certain level of, of, of respect that needs to be maintained. And, and in that case, just like with the sexting case, I, I can totally see that being a, um, being a parallel there. Hmm. Interesting. So is there any... Carolyn. Oh, oh, Carolyn. I was just... I, before our call, I did try to inquire to look for success stories because, as you've heard, yeah. um, restorative justice looks very, very different for depending on the situation. But I was yeah. uh, provided information on one particular, um, what I would consider, and I believe they did as well, a success story was in northern BC in a in a very remote a First Nation community where a young girl was sexually assaulted by a relative, and they basically i think the the family had decided that there would be no criminal charges because they weren't going to um, provide opportunity for this young victim to go to the police and they had amongst their community implemented a restorative justice process that the young girl had the opportunity all the principles existed maybe not in a formal offering like we would see in a different environment but the family members um, I think encouraged the offender to participate but the young girl was the first one to get to make the decision that yes she would be willing and she would op be open to it and uh, the, the results that were shared with me was it was important for her to be able to live within the community with what she deemed shame but that by having someone take responsibility for it, who she grew up with, helped her, um, I won't say move, move <laughs> on, but move on in a different way, as well as to regain some of her dignity and pride that she felt she had lost because someone took ownership for it. And I think that's something the restorative justice process offers that the criminal justice system may not um, and often doesn't. And in some cases, it would be an example of someone who would never have really had the opportunity unless she sought special help to get to a police officer and make a report. Thank you. Ron, Ron if I can add to uh, to that there, uh, I reached out to the uh, Ontario Coalition of Rape Crisis Centers and said, can anybody share any examples? And uh, mm -hmm. the example that was shared was, was very similar, well, similar in that it was an Indigenous example. Um, uh, it was a sexual harassment uh, uh, situation uh, that probably would have met the threshold of, of uh, a charge. It didn't go through the, the justice system. It went through a restorative process uh, <coughs> involving um, a sweat lodge as well. And uh, the feedback from that experience from the, the victim was uh, positive. And, it, it, and the perpetrator was not an Indigenous person. The perpetrator was uh, uh, from outside of the community and they decided to use uh, an Indigenous restorative practice approach to that. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Perhaps the, the, the one of the most famous uh, examples in Canada is the hollow water case eh, in Manitoba, which was one of the studies that was produced probably 15 years ago that was published um, about a, a First Nations community in Manitoba that uh, decided to deal with um, uh, using restorative justice methods to deal with conflict, crime, victimization in their community, including sexual victimization. And what was so interesting is, is that it, Restorative justice has allowed them to have a more holistic approach. And as you say in your examples, bear in mind the impact on the victim, on the offender, and the community as well, because the entire community is impacted. And, uh, and that being strength, focusing on the healing of the individual and as a society, um, rather than simply on, on punishing. Um, and, and that definitely being one of the strengths of it. So uh, there are some very interesting examples that exist, but again, they're, they're not commonplace.
I was just I was actually just going to mention hollow water as well one of the things I think it was hollow water where they said that once they were running that program for a few years they actually began to have perpetrators come forward and disclose spontaneously that they had harmed somebody I'm, I think it may have been hollow water but that the other place that that uh, quote quote may have come from would be Rupert Ross's work and Rupert Ross is um, a uh, I think he was either Crown Counsel or a, cir a, a circuit judge. Is he a circuit judge? He was yeah. a crown. He was a crown uh, up in yeah. Kenora area. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And um, and so he has a couple of books. One of which is called Returning to the Teachings. And I don't think he meant to address uh, restorative justice and sexual assault, but he ends up addressing it because he's he's working in communities where there are quite high rates of. Um, of domestic violence and sexual assault and so he also talks a little bit about how how those implications played out uh, and again uh, if you're interested in um, uh, stories and sort of some just some longitudinal uh, historical cases I think you could you could again contact the community justice initiatives in Kitchener Waterloo um, because they've been doing this for many many years now and they have a, a number of different approaches uh, that they take to to addressing it so I've done a little bit of looking into their uh, program and I'm, I'm inter interested from what I've seen further and find out more about the impacts that they're that they're witnessing I think another example though example that we, we've all heard about here in Canada um, Something just yeah. came up on the screen. Can you guys still hear yeah, me? No, oh yeah, no problem. We're just sending a note out to uh, the live stream viewers where oh, okay, to tweet in. Good. Please continue. That's okay. a, a no, please, uh, Dr. Wimmers. Yeah. The Gian Gomenji case, yeah, which of course everyone uh, heard about in the this year. And uh, the interesting thing that the last victim, Catherine Bottrell, if you if you read her victim her statement to the police that she made, um, essentially that is a form of restorative justice. Uh, while it was through the criminal justice system as such, and they used, I think it was 810, a restraining order, essentially what, what he was admitting to having, she was getting that recognition, ha admitting to having uh, done wrong, although he didn't, you know, the crime, it's not admitting to pleading guilty to an offense, uh, uh, but that recognition was so important for her. So I think it's another example of um, a more restorative approach um, which was probably the best they could arrive at, given the, the horrendous examples, uh, experiences of the other victims uh, previously to prior to that. Um, so I think it, it shows, it contrasts quite quite vividly, um, a res, more of a restorative approach versus the, the, the nightmare that the, the victims uh, in the criminal justice system went through. Um, Joanne, you, you spoke about, mentioned Nova Scotia. I know there are a lot of people from Nova Scotia live streaming. I seem to remember there was uh, there were sexual assault centers some years ago who were doing some work on restorative justice and sexual assault and in fact produced a paper. I can't remember the, the date. It would have been probably 10 years ago. I don't know if you know of any of that work. Or if any of the Nova Scotia uh, people who are live streaming can let us know what you're doing, it would be very interesting. Can I just say something to the live stream? We may have a slight technical problem with the Twitter account not uh, fully abled. So I'm going to suggest an alternative for the viewers because yeah. I don't see anything. There might be something uh, with this. I'm going to give an alternative address for the live stream viewers. Um, you can send it to my email. Um, I'm going to give it to you. Um, orally now and then we're going to write it on the screen so for the live stream viewers please send your messages to and here we go first I'm going to say it lon l o n dot appleby a p p l e b y at durham college dot c a okay so I'll just repeat that and then we're going to actually post it so you you'll see it uh, lon l o n dot appleby a P P L E B Y at Durham D U R H A M College all lowercase all one word dot C A lawn dot Appleby at Durham College dot C A I'll check as well my email just to make sure so okay. we have a backup now okay. for all those out there because the conversation is starting to get pretty okay. rich okay excellent and I'll keep the yeah. uh, I'll keep the Twitter feed going. Just in case it um, they come in that way, yeah, yeah. 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 So keep going. Did you? Okay. 
Okay. Sorry. Um, uh, you were asking Joanne a question. About no, I was just saying that I know that I wish I should have. I should have done my. Sorry, before you, before, you go, before you go further, the Twitter, the Twitter, tons of the questions Twitter I've got. Yeah. Okay. They've all been rerouted, the sorry, guys, automatically to my email. So there's a whole list of Twitter. My apologies to all the live stream viewers. We've, I've got them now here for you. So Joanne can, okay. I'm going to put this in front. So we've got a lot of questions here, okay? So uh, I thought, I thought things were <laughs> something ominous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Everybody's so here being it is. so all quiet. Of, there oh is my. All, the, everything that says via Twitter, via Twitter, via Twitter. So just start okay. clicking. Uh, are you a Mac? Or a PC. I, I can do either. <laughs> I, can do I, I can do okay, either. So just, you can start right at the bottom, bottom here, here at uh, Pamela Harrison, uh, and then go up all the way. There we go. Oh, uh, yes, that that makes sense. Oh, uh, that's a new follower. Just a second. So keep going. There will be a question coming. Ah, uh, here. So let's start with that. Whatever you like. <laughs> Thinking of a. If and how you can address sexual violence. Okay, keep going. I think that's a notice. Oh, view conversation. Uh, In the meantime, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> what uh, I'd like, I'm interested, uh, Sonia. You um, you said that there's some pockets of oh, of restorative oh, justice in Kawatha. Right um, are they? What I'd like to know is yeah. how would one, where would one start, if you would start integrating or at least collaborating with restorative justice? Would you start with training? Would you, uh, you know, where, where does one begin? That, that's a good question, because I, as I was preparing for this, I was thinking, what are the systemic uh, barriers? Uh, where would you start? Um, I know that in our community, and I'm certainly not the uh, expert on it, but um, the restorative practices outside of the school system or the, the primary and secondary school systems uh, here in our area have been uh, taken on by the uh, John Howard Society. And um, um, they did start with training and they did start with uh, community training. Um, if I think about the other communities, the, the restorative approaches have been largely in the uh, young offender system. Mm -hmm. And so there have been uh, individuals trained in, in, in our four counties to provide uh, restorative responses to, uh, to uh, situations involving uh, young people. I really liked that they shared the example of the sexting out, out west. and. Uh, um, and certainly see some uh, applicability there in terms of, of restorative practices. I think for us in this community, it would Great. really be asking ourselves the question, okay. Good. Uh, uh, do we need to start with training? How do we integrate it with victim services? I'm going to stop talking because I think you want to ask those other questions now, yes? Um, well, I have um, I have a number of I, just a couple of things that I want to mention. Um, somebody had tweeted in asking um, whether or not the, um, the the notes would be available. They um, all of Dr. Wimmer's um, presentation notes plus some other um, information um, about this session are are located on the. Uh, global class site. Yes. Um, so if you just if you want access to the notes, you just go into the global class site and just scroll across and click on each of them, and you can access those notes. Um, I do have a couple of comments here from folks. Um, the one comment um, from someone who was a community advisor. Um, to the Dow Dentistry uh, restorative justice process says it was a very powerful, successful process. Um, so that is a very interesting thing. In Nova Scotia, there is a moratorium for restorative justice for gender-based violent crimes. Um, so that is, uh, there's a, an answer to that question about what um, exists. Um, there is also a local and international advisory group, including experts in um, VAW, and that's from Nova Scotia as well. Um, so one question here is, uh, what was the feedback from the women involved in the Dalhousie Restorative Justice on how the process and outcomes went? So I don't know, Dr. Wemmers, whether you can comment on that. Well, I, I can only say that, um, and 
they were they published an article together with uh, Jennifer Llewellyn talking about their experience and so speaking to that article which is available online if, if people want to uh, know read it themselves um, so they took away from it as, as a very positive and constructive experience um, in which they could move forward and actually uh, you know break down barriers break down deal with some of the uh, the, the negative attitudes that had existed and allowed this this to uh, exist in the first place um, and yeah. with an eye to the future in terms of preventing uh, future victimization um, yeah. so and that that was their like story it sounds and they like were the also I, that's a point to mention they were very strongly negatively impacted by the um, negative um, reaction from others when they chose to participate in this restorative um, uh, process uh, all over the media, I'm sure others saw it as well at the time, there was a, this, this outrage that this was happening. And, and, and that was also something that to them was very striking because they expected to find support and instead they were judged. Yeah. Not by the, the, those involved in the process, but by those who had nothing to do with the process and That's were right. looking in. That's right, from the outside. Um, yeah. I do have another question here. This is kind of a broad-based question, and um, I would kind of hope that perhaps maybe the, the um, Peterborough and BC group might be able to answer this. Um, are there police and partners doing restorative practice in Canada? Ooh. Are there That's police and question. partners? Uh, police and partners, well, I, yeah. Yeah, I think there's a couple people in our room that can speak to that, so I'm going to switch out of my chair and invite uh, Peter, um, Peter, do you want to? No? We have uh, some p uh, police services. I'm going to invite Marion to speak to it. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm John Howard Society. Again, I'm not police services. They're not coming What's your name, back the by the way? Sorry. Did I... mm -hmm. My name's What's Marianne your name? Little. I'm sorry. Can you, can you give us your name? I, I don't think we got your name. Did we? Yeah. I, sorry, I, I think I gave it the first time and then I, I neglected again. So it's uh, Marion Little, and I'm with John okay. Howard Sasek in Peter. Marion. Marion, like Meg Marion. And okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And uh, I was out in BC for 22 years on Vancouver Island, and I know there's quite a close relationship between the RCMP uh, in the Saanich Peninsula, just outside of Victoria and uh, restorative justice programs there. I also know that in the city of Victoria, there is a restorative justice program that meets in the, the uh, I think it's just called RJ Victoria, and they serve um, the, the city of Victoria and receive a lot of referrals. It's entirely volunteer run. Uh, and then here in Peterborough, we have at the John Howard Society, a court diversion program, and so when um, cases come to the attention of police, they can divert that rather than pressing a charge. That can be diverted to John Howard. These are youth-related youth, uh, youth related cases. Uh, and then if they do press a charge and it goes to court, that can also be diverted. And so um, we have uh, youth conferencing, which is what Joanne spoke about earlier. Uh, I don't think that we've dealt with any sexual assault cases that way. We did recently have a request, though, from a situation where an adult teacher had been assaulted by a youth, um, an adolescent youth, uh, in a school setting. The youth was expelled, and by the end of the summer, the teacher was saying, well, what, you know, this is, like, we can't, uh, you know, how do we, how do we uh, proceed? Because soon that student's going to be back in class again, and nothing has happened to make anything different except that they were you know, cut out. So uh, there was a desire there um, for reparation, and uh, there's a fellow who used to lead the restorative justice processes within the school district who, who uh, I think was contacted for that. But ideally, the sexual assault center here would, uh, in time, we would begin collaborating together to develop, to develop something in, in this area. Uh, but I would say that the police, uh, in terms of the youth uh, restorative justice, there's quite a close relationship uh, between uh, police work mm -hmm. and uh, and what's happening at, at John Howard around that. And and again, my experience in Victoria and Saanich Peninsula, same thing. 
Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we're getting a number of, of tweets, well, actually, and a number of emails um, from folks who are sending in some fantastic resources. Um, so I, I think what we'll do is um, at the end, I will ask um, Lon yeah. and his group if they can sure. post these resources on the Global Class site so that everyone can have access to them. I'll let so you know, just so you know, uh, for everybody, that we will have an actual web page where the recorded class will be posted this class and all the resources will be there so all on one page you'll be able to go there and on our network as well and and on on the victim justice network we'll we'll, we'll let you know we'll send out an email blast but it will be a one stop place where you can go and have this class it's a resource plus all the resources you're sending in thank you very much for them Okay, and I'm 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 going these I'm going through these in no particular order. They're really just as they are coming in. Um, so I do have a question. This would be uh, Carolyn, I think, for your group. Um, this is from um, uh, RCMV Victim Services, uh, saying I'm just wondering how an RCMP Victim Services program in the interior of BC should be making referrals to sort of justice program. So don't know if you can speak to that. Hi there, it's Heather Hi, Hildred Heather. from <laughs> E-Division RCMP. Um, I would say that you could make a referral just like you would any um, other agency. I don't know if you have a restorative justice program in your area, but I'm sure I, uh, I'm sure I would know the person that's asking the question if I knew your name because it's one of our uh, detachment RCMP police-based victim services, so hello. Um, usually for any of the police-based victim service programs, if you were going to make a referral to a restorative justice program, you would share the same type of information with that victim or witness or impacted client's consent. And that's big for the RCMP. The RCMP works under federal <coughs> legislation. We do need to get consent of the victim that we're working with before we share information. And then we would share tombstone information such as name of the individual, phone number, date of birth, a summary of uh, the incident. And if we wanted to share anything more, we would also get that client's consent. And then you would either phone, email, or fax over whichever method you make referrals to that program, or you could also ask that individual, the victim, if they wanted to phone and make contact with the RJ program themselves. Save that, the other method would be if the police officer was involved in that file, in that investigation, and wanted to make the referral him or herself, the police can also make a referral to restorative justice, and they may have already done that. I hope that covers that question. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I, I have another one. This is a this is a, a question basically to end, to everyone here because it's a it's a very broad based um, contextual question. Um, curious on how folks are envisioning dealing with the societal sanction aspect of sexual assault, um, and that is how can we proceed with a victim needs based approach that also doesn't decriminalize sexual assault. So that's a pretty oh, big question. I, I think it's important to point out that, that dealing with it in a restorative justice way doesn't decriminalize it. It's still, it no. can still be considered a crime. That, that, that has to be completely clear. In the Dalhousie example, it hadn't been reported to police while it, 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 yeah. posting uh, these messages hadn't, from what I understood, uh, they, they didn't see enough of a, a, a basis for criminal, I don't even think they even reported it to the police. They, that was their choice. Um, so there wasn't a criminal offense to go forward with, but when a person, for example, a young offender would per commit a crime and goes into restorative justice, it, it's not decriminalizing it um, as such. You, it's still a crime that's been committed. Rather, you're dealing with the crime, you're reacting to the crime in a different way. So that's an important distinction. But, but I just I, want to say, I think from a public point of view, I get what the question is, is that if, in fact, the victim agrees to go into restorative justice as because they don't want to necessarily report or, in fact, go through the regular justice system, does this, this, this diminish the crime in, yeah. in the greater yeah. view, in the, in the public context. view? Yeah. And I can see that and that's, that's a real question of communication, which often fails. Yeah, that's right. 
And it just seems to me, given that there's a moratorium now in Nova Scotia, um, you know, we still are battling with that idea of restorative justice and it seems to be the, and sexual assault. So I, I shouldn't be chipping in, but I, I, believe, that this be. is a, I believe that this is a, definitely a communication. It's of articulating it in a way and embedding the, the idea that this does not mean it's not a criminal act. Right. It means that this is a, a wish on the part of the victim. Hi there. I wanted yeah. to jump in from uh, BC as well. It's Heather again. Um, I, I definitely think that that concern is one that needs to be addressed and needs fulsome discussion because I think that is where some of the um, questioning and um, concern came in terms of the Dalhousie uh, process from even a uh, uh, personal perspective when I was watching that Dalhousie process there was not a lot of information around what restorative justice is why they chose to go that route that there weren't um, criminal charges possible to be laid and and I think that it's um, I think that it's definitely a concern in that on the one hand, we're talking about sexual assault and sexual violence as being um, almost an unforgivable unforgivable crime but then on the other hand we're talking about restorative justice i think that uh we definitely need to have that discussion that if there's a crime that's been committed it does need to go through the court system it, rj can also be run concurrently but if there's a crime that's committed it needs it needs to be pursued and i i think that ties into the comment that i i think it was Marianne that made when she was talking about, and maybe it was tongue in cheek, but she was talking about if universities uh, pursued every single incident, they'd have to kick everybody out of the universities. <laughs> that's a, that's a funny statement. It's a funny, it's a funny statement, but it's also very, very true. And it's not yeah. just universities. We look at Trump. We look at all the comments that have yeah. been made, yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. I think we really need to be alive to the fact that. If we are going through RJ processes, we need to share with the general public what RJ is and that it's not taking away from the um, exactly. criminal charges that could be laid, because I think that that will set us back um, if people don't understand that aspect. And I can use the sexual assault or the sexting example again. When um, the police and the justice system, victim services, RJ, were going through those sexting files, some of the conversation was, oh, well, what type of charges are, go are we going to lay? How are we going to move forward? And we had to have that conversation around, yes, this happened online. Yes, this was sexting. But we have to look at the criminal charges that can be applied. And they definitely could be. There were criminal charges. Um, RJ was um, run concurrently, and they made that decision to move forward in that process. But um, it's not... It's not an easy question. We don't want to take away from the decriminalizing aspect because sexual violence is very serious. It's just that we need to tie in how RJ can can be utilized to support a victim's wishes in that process and, and also the accused. I think that the example somebody used of an accused learning more about um, hollow water and disclosing um, by themselves, I think that's very powerful. We need to look at both sides of the situation. So I just wanted to add that. It, 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 it also to add to that, because you said it needs to go through the court system, but that's what we started with, the, the, the justice gap. It's not going through the court system. So how can we make sure that we are reacting to it rather than not reacting? Because the reality is, is that 90% aren't being reported and of that even a smaller percentage is going to lead to a conviction. So essentially, are we condoning it? No. We, we have to find an other way of responding. That doesn't mean decriminalizing it. That's not, that's not on the table. It's finding a way to deal with it that might be more constructive um, for victims but in the this, first place and for offenders in the second place. But at the yeah, same time... Yeah, I very time, much agree. So it's therapeutic oh, well, and it's constructive, but at the same time, it is illegal and it is criminal and it's violent. So in other words, you know, we don't want to diminish, <coughs> diminish the, 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 the offense itself. That's the, that's the communications piece. Um, exactly. To say, you know, because yes, it's therapeutic, absolutely. 
and it's in etc etc it's a constructive way of, of, of working but the big problem is that we've still got to and we've seen how loosely it's been thrown around with by Trump mm -hmm. I mean unbelievable mm -hmm. stuff just mm -hmm. being thrown out yeah. there yeah. You know, with any, without any recognition that this is this is violence and it's sexual violence and it's gender violence, yeah. mm -hmm. and we've still got that's the balance. And I think I, I hope this conversation will continue because we really maybe need Trump to. can go through an RJ process <laughs> <laughs> for the rest of his life. Yeah, yeah. But the tragic thing is that he's already been found not guilty, yeah. hasn't he? Yeah, yeah he sure has. <laughs> Anyway, um, go there. I just wanted to mention Here's somebody new. No, that's okay. We've heard from the um, program coordinator at Revive, um, Mary. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. I am Leslie Wayne, the Revive program coordinator at Community Justice Initiatives. Within the Re Revive program, we oh. offer an RJ-based support service called Facilitated Dialogue that supports individuals, families, and groups who have been impacted by sexual harm. This service is facilitated by trauma-informed staff who have expertise in sexual trauma, trauma survivorship and sexual offending behavior. There are no fees for, for, for participants, nor is the service time limited. The average FD case takes approximately six to eight months to complete. We, have provide, we are providing this particular service for many years and participant feedback has been very positive, identifying safety, voice and empowerment. Um, any interested parties can contact her via the CJI website, um, which we can put on the resource page as well, but it's www.cjiwr.com. So there you go. <laughs> um, now I have a, one, I had kind of popped up here, but I wanted to, um, now I've lost okay. it. I've lost it. Hang on just one second. Go to another speaker. Oh, okay. Someone else wanted to say something? Yes. Oh, <laughs> oh go just ahead. Sorry. Were... No, that's okay. Sherry Gallagher um, from New West Police in BC. Just in regards to what Heather was talking about, and we're talking about Trump and public perception and Dalhousie and all that, I think um, that we're already struggling with the perception and probably a lot of truth to it that the court process is more in favor of the offender than the victim. So I think as well that the public view of RJ is that it's more a benefit to the offender than the victim. And I think that we really need to, um, you know, do some educating with the public and, and a little bit. Perception. Perception. Yeah, perception. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask, uh, I should be participating because I'm the <laughs> director of the co class. I'm just trying to help, but the conversation is so interesting. I, I just want to just ask, is anybody here? Are you okay? Do you want to say anything? If not, I'll fire a question here, but are you sure? I think we'll say something that comes to mind. Yeah, okay, because I can give you the mic. No problem, okay? Um, what was super fascinating was the, it's okay, was yeah, okay. the sexting. Because I think, like, when you talk to any women on Tinder, on Facebook, like, the amount of unwanted dick pics is, like, astounding. <laughs> like, it's, like, every, I would, sorry, I would say the majority of women do experience that we don't take that as uh, until it like reaches a profound level as something that's like a criminal case and so I think with the restorative process it um, like it almost justifies in a way that they like are able to recognize what they've done whereas in the criminal side you know as I forget who mentioned it saying that it's difficult to you know what are they um, holding themselves like accountable to in the criminal system in a sense you know what I mean like it's you just right yeah right. you're either found guilty or you're either found guilty or you're not found guilty in the criminal process and they don't care mm -hmm. yeah versus the rj process where there can be some <clears throat> recognition of wrongdoing and a discussion about that and healing etc yeah um, i do have another resource on here um um I'd like to bring your attention to the Correctional Services Canada Restorative Opportunities Program. Uh, for several years they have worked with very serious federally sentenced offenders and their victims. Uh, many of these cases have involved sexual assaults and incest and have had positive results. So we will post that website um, on the resources page as well. Um, we, I'm very cognizant of the time here. I, I, <laughs> 
Yeah, we, we, we're just kind of getting rolling here. Um, but, it's the way it is with the global class, by the yeah. way, the first one, so we can do it again. <laughs> yes, and there are definitely more, um, more questions here. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for your tweets and your emails. I'm, I'm sorry that we, didn't, we weren't able to get to but them quicker. <laughs> Put them off to it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we can certainly look at them um, afterwards. If you continue to send them in, that would be great. But I know that we are our, our time slot is um, to 2 o'clock, and I realize that every, everyone else has places that they have to be. Um, what I would like to do just, um, just uh, quickly to kind of, there's been so much information that's gone back and forth. And Dr. Wemmers, thank you so much for kind of launching us into this conversation. It's been fabulous. Um, but I just, I just wanted to find out um, maybe some quick, like one minute-ish, <laughs> last words from um, both uh, Kwartha, uh, your group, Sonia, and Carolyn, your group as well. Um, in terms of, you know, next steps, next questions um, in terms of the restorative justice and sexual violence area. So, Sonia, can I start with you? Sure. Uh, just um, really great that you're going to post all of the resources. And our, so our next steps will be to uh, grapple with the conversation further. And uh, we, have, we have some great resources in Peterborough that we... We hope to include in that conversation, including the, the restorative program at the John Howard Society. Um, so our next steps is just further grappling and uh, um, we'll, uh, we, we hope to uh, engage in a conversation around this issue again. Great. And can I just add, you can grapple with it online through the Global Class Forum page. There is a place for all participants in this class to go. It's already prepared where you can continue the discussion if you would like. Uh, or, 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 okay, so I'll let P Peter, do you want to uh, address yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, one of, a lot of people have questions about resources. Uh, we have a website, so it's victimjusticenetwork.ca, and people that, got, that registered for our website for, our, for this uh, session today would have probably been aware of it. We're currently uh, revising and updating the entire site. So one of the things that we're looking to do is to post a lot of resource-based information so that people look looking for information about referrals or agencies or where to go for programs. So if you send us that information, we can certainly add it to our website if it's not there already. And the idea is that there will always be an opportunity for people mm -hmm. to look for yeah. this type of information. And we encourage all agencies and everyone in our network to share this type of yeah. information that we can put on okay. online. Great. And, and might I just add, if you have any suggestions of uh, what else we could be looking at or want to talk to us, our, um, send us an email. It's all on the site. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Carolyn, your group, any last Comments? Yeah, I, I think for us, what we came for, we got um, as partners of the Victim Justice Network. This this whole resource has entitled us to take our our conversation to a much bigger level, and I think that's really what's going to make the catalyst for change. Um, the restorative justice discussion, I think, looks so different in any corner of our province. So to be able to have it across the country. I think can only bring success and, and keep the conversation moving. So from all of us, I think that we're looking forward to finding out how do we keep the conversation going here and then put into bigger voices. So thanks for all the help and the technical support. I think we're going to mobilize Lawn and just make sure um, <laughs> that we can be in and do this together again. Well, yeah. I, I'm so thrilled that that we we have a partner in Priscilla and Peter, and of course my colleague Joanne and and the technical team. Now we, I I know that we just keep working hard technically to make this happen, and we can see the results. So mm -hmm. I look forward to doing it again. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Carolyn, for your time. Uh, Thanks, Dr. Joanne. Wemmers. Oh, th oh, you're welcome. Th and, um, Dr. Wemmers, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Just in well, thank you. It, it's been fun. It's been a good experience. I'm going to send you a resource from um, in Leuven Institute of Criminology in Belgium. They've been doing a lot of really interesting work on it, and they pra they published a practice guide uh, for doing restorative justice in cases of sexual violence. I'll send you the link because uh, okay. anyone who wants to engage in this or wants to know more about it uh, would find this an interesting resource. So thanks okay. again. Eh? It's been great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And just uh, just a last mo point for the our um, um, live stream folks, if you could just uh, please at the end of this, if you could just please make sure you fill out that survey. 
um, because it'll be really, really important for the Victim Justice Network moving forward with other global classrooms because uh, we just want to continue with the conversations. All right, so thank you. Is there anything else we... We are a little over time. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.